Uh, welcome back to the Energy Sovereignty Project and our much anticipated closeout for the year of 2019. Uh, for those that might be just joining us, we've been operating the home for the last year off of 10.2 kilowatts of solar production on the roof and six of Tesla's Powerwall 2 batteries. And that's allowed us then to maximize the efficiency of the overall system and allow us to stretch our production into those shoulder periods, and we'll go over uh, that in, in a moment here. I'm going to break these into a series of videos of 15 or 20 minutes in length so that we wind up keeping them to kind of a digestible length so that uh, uh, we, don't, we don't lose anybody. And this first one is going to be obviously an overview of the system as a whole, how it did over the course of the year, and we'll look at it in kind of a dollars and cents standpoint to uh, see where the uh, where the system stands. Also, we're looking at uh, uh, some driving on sunlight. But then we're also going to break out these videos into categories like driving on sunlight. We'll talk about some of the nuances to that for those that are that are interested in adding an electric vehicle or two to your uh, to your system at home. Uh, and then also we'll be looking at um, things like the uh, maintenance of the of the batteries that we've had over the course of the year. How reliable ha have they been? What do we project that out as being uh, uh, going into the future? Uh, some of the issues that we've had, especially some of the software issues, we'll get into detail with that. And then also things like losses. Um, the amount of solar that we brought in as opposed to the amount that we wound up losing in the battery as we transferred it from the battery to the vehicle or having it sit in the uh, in the battery. What, is that, uh, what does that look like over the course of a year? So I think we've got a lot, to, uh, a lot to chew on. But to start us off, let's go ahead and head back over to the studio and take a look at just a general overview of the system system and what we got out of it this past year. Well, welcome back to the studio and our first video in our uh, system in-depth series that we're going to have that involves our year-long study, the Energy Sovereignty Project. And let's get right into this because we've got a lot to cover. So, 496 kilowatt hours. That is how much power we had to pay for at the end of this year's operation, less than half a month's worth of, uh, uh, of, of power. So in total, uh, the system used 13,377 kilowatt hours, and that is an average of uh, 1,114 kilowatt hours per, uh, per month, or 37 kilowatt hours per day. So in short, we nailed it. Because I had a year or almost a year to look at the home's daily usage numbers, I was able to do a lot of fine tuning of the uh, of the home's consumption. So initially it looked like we were gonna come in a little short. And so what I wound up doing is I went through the house and I actually pulled out all of the energy efficient LED bulbs that we had and replaced them with incandescent bulbs. And that I felt would get us right up to uh, where we needed to be. And because of that fine tuning I did, we managed to uh, average in the Energy Sovereignty Project home nearly exactly the national average of energy used per household per day. A little bit over, but that, that's fine. And so, you know, if you take a look at this and your home is a little bit higher or a little bit lower, it might be, our goal was to come as close as we could to that 30 kilowatt hour a day average for U.S. Uh, home consumption so that we could make sure that people wouldn't look at this study and say, oh, you know, your system is 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 smaller than it than uh, than the average house, or your roof is larger than what most people have available to them, and so we just wanted to make sure that we ha were able to handle any argument that uh, that might come up, and so that was what we did, and so uh, then we went and focused on uh, just the household. We wanted to make sure that the household was run just as any normal household would. Here's the graph for the year for that. And that was easy. We just didn't alter our natural usage in any way. And again, to 
show exactly what that usage was, we did our weekly, uh, our daily logs and our uh, weekly recap of our uh, uh, videos so that anybody could feel free to follow along. And many of you did. And some of you I, I uh, got feedback were actually plugging in those numbers into your own spreadsheets. That's fantastic to kind of uh, take a look at, uh, at, at how we were doing. But let's stretch this graph out so that you can see how the various components interacted with each other each month. So here we go. And uh, this should give you a nice overview of the system's performance for the year. Take a moment with this and pause the video if you need to so that you can digest this before we continue. But uh, what, what are we looking at here? So you can see here the solar production tracks nicely with the home's usage for much of the year. The uh, home's highest energy usage coinciding with our highest periods of production. The amount of uh, excess to the grid peaking in May and September, you can see there those uh, areas where the, uh, they go beneath the line. And sending uh, little to no power out in August where the heat not only reduced the efficiency of the system, you can see that in the uh, slight reduction uh, uh, over the same placement on the uh, front side of the year, uh, but uh, also because we added to the home's load because of the AC being on a whole lot more. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm pretty pleased with myself that I managed to size the system to do exactly what I needed it to do. And that was to match the needs of a home using an average of 30 kilowatt hours per day. And the reason I felt that that was imperative to scale again to the size, it, it was simple. Just like I said, from the beginning, our mandate was to represent a home that was not so large and not so small that it could be said that we were cutting any kind of corners uh, at all and, and you know again the size of the roof needed to be realistic the size of the system installed needed to be uh, uh, realistic but large right on the on the upper end of what people would install and uh, the project was designed to be an argument ender either way either it would work or it wouldn't and we would have put out all this information even if it hadn't worked. Because again, the whole reason for doing this is to be able to help people scale their systems appropriately. And as we did so, we needed to make sure that it was realistic, that somebody couldn't then come along later and say, yeah, but. So when I first started looking into this, my uh, calculations were uh, actually for 30 kilowatt hours per day home usage, that that would require a um, uh, uh, eight kilowatt inverter supplied by 10 kilowatts of solar PV production and have 90 kilowatts of battery storage. Basically my thought there was, again, with the system completely shut off, you'd be able to go three days or so with, uh, without, any, uh, um, uh, without any input whatsoever. And so, what was calculated and what was installed are actually pretty close. The uh, system as you see it in the Energy Sovereignty Project is 10.2 uh, kilowatts of PV production on the roof. Uh, and since there weren't any eight kilowatt inverters available, we used a 7.6 uh, kilowatt uh, inverter. The battery storage, uh, as you've seen, comes from six of the Powerwall 2s, and that gives us a, uh, a total capacity, pull that data sheet up there, brings up a, a total capacity uh, of uh, 81 kilowatt hours of storage, 13 and a half kilowatt hours per uh, battery. And the challenge then was to uh, get the system uh, get the system that was that large approved by a local utility. As soon as you start getting over that kind of a seven to eight kilowatt range, then the, it gets the attention of the public utilities and then they want to try and uh, uh, scale you back. We were able to, because we had an electric vehicle and also because uh, the system had batteries, we were able to use that uh, with some leverage to be able to get the system to be installed. So I scaled the system at 10.2 kilowatts of, uh, of PV knowing that that rating, whenever you see that rating on a, uh, on, on a uh, 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 um, solar panel, that is a bench rating. And there's always going to be some reduction in output from that ideal, um, especially if you, you know, are, are living at a, a, a farther up, uh, at a higher latitude. Again, this system was designed and scaled for use at 
this latitude at the latitude around Sacramento, California. So you draw that line around the globe and then if you are below that, you're probably going to wind up doing a little bit better in sunny days. If you are above that, uh, in, in, that uh, in latitude or if you are higher in elevation, your mileage may vary. Um, but the, uh, uh, when you look at uh, the uh, system as a whole, the, uh, uh, here's the roof. And uh, so uh, what you see here is the, these panels here are north facing panels and the panels here are uh, shaded in the morning. And we wanted to make sure, again, that the system represented that average home in, in, in suburbia. We didn't want to uh, put on so many panels that, it was, uh, that the system could be judged as unrealistic. We wanted to keep everything uh, 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 pretty much anywhere, anywhere USA. Now, obviously, your mileage, again, may vary. Maybe you are in uh, an area that is, is an older neighborhood, more established trees, and so then shading might be a little more uh, of an issue for you. Um, so everybody's going to wind up having their own uh, uh, different experience with that part of it. But here is the result now of that equipment. The uh, Result is that you see here that the system peaks out in output in the spring at just over 8 kilowatt and uh, this rails our 7.6 kilowatt inverter for a few hours from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can see there as that goes and it does that for about two weeks out of the year now the trade-off for that, uh, the reason that we went with that 7.6 as opposed to going with a 10 is that for the remainder of the year, especially in winter when your output from the panels is, is very much reduced, uh, the system as a whole winds up running more efficiency, uh, more efficiently. And so even though you, you lose that little bit uh, as part of the clipping, you more than make up uh, for that. Now, I calculated those losses from the clipping and we're going to be presenting them in a follow-up video that's related specifically to the losses in the system. And we'll be addressing that separately so that this video doesn't wind up being an hour and a half long. So. The uh, overall battery system, so here's Tesla's data sheet. The uh, reality is, is that the overall losses are actually closer to 14 to 15% when allowances are made for power just sitting in the batteries. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we'll just save that uh, also for the video on the losses alone where we cover all of that. But uh, as you can see here, uh, though, the solar produced basically uh, matched what was used by the home or exceeded it uh, a, a bit there, as you can see, and that excess then wound up going into the batteries. Uh, and then all but uh, January and December uh, were mostly covered. Uh, and so from a pure expenditure standpoint, how did we do? Well. The first thing that's important to mention here is that though the Energy Sovereignty Project started on the first of the year, that was just when the batteries finally got here and got up and up and running. They'd actually arrived about a month or so before, as you saw for the install video. But the solar had been in place since February of 2018. And so because of that, we'd run nearly a year before we actually started the project. And so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what the utility companies call a true up. And so if your utility company has what's called net metering and then banks that extra power for you, then they will either credit you for that excess amount at the end of the year or they'll cut you a check on the anniversary date of your install. And if you wound up using more power, obviously, than you put into the system, then you'll wind up having to pay that, uh, that difference. We add uh, a little bit to, uh, to pay, as you'll see here. Um, but um, as we said, our, our install date was February of 2018. So in February of 2019, a couple of months after we actually uh, had started the Energy Sovereignty Project, our utility company cut us a check for $250.80, and that was the amount of the 
um, overage of last year, the difference between what we sent them as opposed to uh, what we wound up using. And so uh, as we look at the numbers for the overall cost of the year, I'll let you decide whether or not it's fair to deduct that 250 from our 2019 bill or not. Um, but uh, also as a part of the regular bill, we have a fixed infrastructure charge and a tax that averaged out to $20.80 per month in 2019. That came to a total of $249.60 for the year. And on February 2020, we had a final true up that covered basically that period that we ran the Energy Sovereignty Project. And that true up for the year was $108.47, uh, but that also included that 20 now $21 uh, uh, infrastructure fee. And so the actual true up was $87.47. And if we add this to the infrastructure fees that we paid in 2019, our grand total outlay for power for the year was $337.07 out of pocket for the entire year of 2019. And so now you can make your own decision at this point whether it's fair if we deduct that $250.80 that we were paid from the previous year or not. If we do that, then our total expenditure for the year uh, for electricity last year was $86.00 and 27 cents. Not bad. But that's not the whole story here, is it? Because we were driving. So now we get to see why we didn't get that $250 check this year. Over the course of the Energy Sovereignty Project in 2019, we drove 10,095.3 miles on nothing but sunlight spare sunlight. So let's pull up the data from the car so that we can understand what that actually means. Here we go. So this is the data recorded at midnight on the 1st of January, 2020. Trip A was reset one year prior. And in total, we've covered 20,898.2 miles. Nearly half of that distance was driven on nothing but sunlight. The percentage gets even better when you consider the fact that we took a trip of just over 4,000 miles there and back to Minnesota. And if we subtract that, then we would have driven the car 16,900 miles and allowing all but 6,805 miles then to be driven on uh, nothing but sunlight, totally emissions free. Again. We'll do a separate video on nothing but the driving, but I think it's important to at least mention this here in case you want to have that discussion about electric vehicles being just as dirty as gas vehicles. They're not. So, what does this mean in terms of our power bill? Well, as you can see from the vehicle data, back up, uh, the car averaged 327 watt hours per mile averaged over the course of this entire past year. And so what that means is, is that it takes the car 32.7 kilowatt hours to travel each 100 miles. So that's a way to kind of keep that, keep that math simple. So we traveled a total of 10,095 miles. If you divide that by those 100 mile increments, then that winds up giving us 100.95, multiply that by 32.7 kilowatt hours, because that's what we get per 100 miles, and we get 3,301 kilowatt hours that was sent to the car that we did not send to the grid. Now, if we had sent that power to the grid, our average uh, of, of about 13 cents or so per kilowatt hour that, uh, that they would have paid us, our utility company would have cut us a check for $429.14. So, should we have taken the cash? Well, to answer that, let's have a breakdown of this in two different ways. Let's take the simple way first. Let's simply compare that 429.14 to what we could have gotten for gasoline. Boom. So I'm going to use a Mercedes S-Class with a combined uh, city and highway uh, uh, MPG of 24 miles per gallon because I think that that's a fair comparison uh, to the Model S, the uh, same price range thereabouts and so 
For the most of 2019, our local gasoline prices hovered around $4 a gallon. As of the release date of this video, it's down now to $3.23 for mid-grade, so we'll go ahead and use that. So, 429.14 divided by the price per gallon, that's 133 gallons. 3,189 miles if we had used the, uh, the Mercedes S-Class instead of the Model S. So if we wanted to go the entire 10,095 miles in an S-Class, that's going to cost you $1,359. So if you have an electric vehicle, use the sunlight. For some though, that uh, argument doesn't hold water since the car doesn't actually use gas. And that's a, a valid point. The comparison only works if you're playing that justification game and trying to <laughs> justify buying a Model S, I don't know, over a, uh, over a gasoline car. But again, that comparison only works if you're matching that mile for mile, dollar for dollar against a gasoline car. In the end, if it's just dollars and cents, the car cost you $429.14. That's the amount that you didn't get back from your utility that you would have uh, had you sent that extra power to the grid. Or did it? So now, let's go ahead and take a closer look at this. So I don't know your situation. Maybe you can fully charge your car at work for free. Maybe you have free supercharging for life. Whatever reason you want the cash, maybe you just want to stick it to the man, who knows. But here's where it gets a little more complicated. I'll try not to go too far off into the weeds with this, but this is an important point to make here. Currently, the utility companies are trying to convince your neighbors and trying to convince your, your policy makers that solar is bad, that, the, that it's bad for the grid, the evil solar producers are to blame, and this is where forcing them to pay you that extra 476 bucks a, a, a year is really ultimately going to come back to bite you in the end. Firstly, the money itself will be used as a huge hammer to try and get rid of net metering altogether. I can already smell that. It's going away. We'll cover one of the other reasons why that is. And so it's probably best at this point not to actually count on getting that money back at the end of the year. It's more important at this point to figure out how to balance your system so that you just simply use as little power from the grid as possible. So more dangerous than that though, is the fact that they're going to use the, this duck curve, the fact that you sent all that power to the grid, they're gonna use that and want it back, because again, we'll be talking about a system here that doesn't have batteries now, mind you, right? Uh, but they're, they're gonna use that duck curve that it creates as a reason to start charging solar contributing, uh, contributors a nuisance fee to try and recover what they feel as their loss, right? Now, a while back, we did a video on the duck curve. We also showed what the duck curve would look like if our system didn't have batteries. We chose the month of June for our example because this was the worst case month, best case for solar production, but worst case in the uh, case of the utilities. And so every day you see here, the power company has to ramp up, ramp down, and ramp back up again as the homes start to produce more and more solar power. That curve just winds up get dip winds up getting is worse and worse and worse and worse and so the companies then are, are scrambling to try and keep up with the power generation needed at the end of the day not only does the solar quit producing but everybody comes home and now what do they do they want to charge their electric car on the power that you gave them during the day and now you want it back well this is one day of the duck curve and uh, so if you haven't seen the other video that we did on the duck curve, I'd recommend that you go and, and, and take a look at that. But it's uh, fun that this graph is now actually so old that we're actually at the date that they predicted would be a problem. So uh, let's see how we stack up against their projections. So if you look at this graph, let's be clear that this part, 
isn't the part that they're concerned about. The low part in the curve is the height of solar production about midday, and that's when the utilities are making the least amount of power. And what they don't want to tell you is, is that that's also the time when you are making the most amount of power for them. And then they wind up turning around and selling that at a premium. The peak load part that you see here, that's the part that they're concerned about. Not because it's high, they love to sell you power. They're concerned about it because it comes on so suddenly and they're just not capable of, of, of keeping up. And so here's our hypothetical month in June again. And so now let's go ahead and replace that hypothetical month in June with what really happened with the Energy Sovereignty Project. So just a fun little fact as you look at this, we were uh, the only day in the month that we actually weren't driving on sunlight in June was the 13th and uh, that's the day I wound up putting new tires uh, and a new windshield in the car as we uh, uh, set off on our trip uh, for uh, Minnesota in July. But uh, what are we looking at here? So what you're looking at, uh, the days when we sent power to the grid are marked with this symbol here. And aside from Friday the 7th, we didn't actually send much power to the grid. Most of it was actually sent to the car for driving, as you'll see in just a second. The AC was also fairly high. We had an unseasonably hot uh, June last year. And as you look at this, I want you to remember that the utility company hasn't been complaining about the power you send to the grid via solar. They're fine with that, since as long as they have someone to buy it, they can sell it at a premium. So now the problem for them may come in the near future during summer when no one's buying. Why would nobody be buying, you ask? Well, here's how much power we used in the month of June. Mm. Nothing, really, aside from a few switching errors on days when we uh, exported to the grid. We used absolutely nothing from the grid in June. And in June, we wound up driving a total of 1,670 miles, powering the house and driving, with not so much as touching the grid at all. And if by to say oh, 2028 or so that most suburban households have batteries in their homes and are doing this, the market for that excess power could collapse. And now, initially, the utilities are going to pretend, oh, well, this is exactly what they want. They want this amount of, uh, of reduction of, uh, of use on the grid. But when you start to look at this really closely, the scenario is probably the farthest thing from what they actually want to happen. The last thing the utilities are going to want to admit is that they're going to have to actually scale back their production. They want to sell you power. For them, selling power is where it's at. We are now telling them, basically, that we expect them to sit on their hands for six months out of the year, seven months out of the year. And here's how bad that gets. Remember this graph we showed at the top. This is uh, 2019 at a glance here, and let me break this down for you month by month. From March to the end of August, in March we used 38 kilowatt hours from the grid. In April, 4.4 kilowatt hours. May, 17 kilowatt hours. In uh, June, we uh, wound up using 8.7 kilowatt hours. July crept up a little bit, 24 kilowatt hours. August, 72 kilowatt hours. And then February and September, we were up to a whopping 152 kilowatt and 129 kilowatt hours, respectively. And that's eight months, nearly no consumption at all. And to put that uh, last bit into perspective, 129 kilowatt hours is roughly uh, 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 4.8 kilowatt hours uh, for, the, for an entire day or approximately what it would take to power 200 watt light bulbs for every day for, uh, for a month. So the biggest issue for the utility companies is going to be how to scale back for this new reality and uh, at the same time maintain a readiness for the part of the year when we are actually going to need them in winter, as you see here. And so let's take a look at our uh, winter usage. And the peak grid usage uh, for us now uh, it occurs uh, at the tail end of November and then into December, and then the beginning to the middle of January. And so before and after that, the home is more or less 
self-sufficient. Now again, I do say the home, it's important to remember here that we are still driving. So any power used by the car will obviously be uh, on, uh, on top of this, uh, uh, tracking the Minnesota trip again. Uh, we traveled uh, 16,900 miles. And so if you average that over the year, you get wind up 46 uh, miles per day. And then again, with the car's efficiency of uh, uh, 300 and uh, 27 uh, watt hours per mile, you wind up with a home using an average of 15 kilowatt hours per day. And so obviously if you're not producing that, if you're not charging the car off of that, then you're going to wind up being uh, uh, buying that uh, uh, 15 kilowatt hours per day um, uh, from the uh, grid or uh, charging the car elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to Again, do that separate video where we talk about just driving. So again, I'll save that discussion for uh, another time. I just wanted people to understand that the car wasn't included on days like this. Uh, that way, when, when we started the project, I made the decision to exclude the car when it wasn't being charged from the system just to clean up the numbers for no other reason. It's easy to add that stuff on later, but... Um, if it muddies the water when we're uh, when we're trying to show people the actual production of the system, you get the idea. So for now, let's focus on the usage number for those three months. And another a bit of full disclosure, I want to point out a couple things about that graph, the combined graph you see here. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice is you got that huge spike in early December, followed by six days where we didn't use the grid at all. That is the result of one of our rogue charges to the battery. Uh, in December and January, we were having a hell of a time with our system. I'll also be doing a uh, separate video um, on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, system's reliability as a whole. And so uh, again, we'll uh, um, not uh, uh, not burden this too much by uh, by going into that now. But uh, just so that you'll know that that's going to be uh, a topic that we're going to be discussing. Uh, it's important for folks to know how reliable these systems are going to be if they're going to uh, uh, be able to uh, um, deal with this for the long haul. Uh, but uh, now that you've all had a chance to take a look at that first combined graph, let's go ahead and take a look at these months where we will include solar contribution. So for these months, you're noticing several periods where there's little to no grid power uh, drawn at all. And so, uh, as we said before, this period of low grid use here is artificial. It was caused by that rogue charge event that we had uh, that you see sticking up there. And then uh, that charged the batteries instead of solar. But the rest of uh, what you see here is uh, legitimate. That's uh, this is uh, our solar contribution here for these three months, and as you can see, it's somewhat reduced, but it's still far from nothing. And these are the usual months where the home usage will outstrip the overall production. You can see that there. That's uh, one of the best ways to kind of uh, look at it there. We'll see it on, a, um, on the next graph as well. Uh, but uh, when you're measuring it there against the uh, uh, the solar against the home use is the best way to look at that at a glance. Um, this November and, and uh, October were also unseasonably sunny and because of this I, I think we've done slightly better than usual especially in October where you can see that we only used 60.1 kilowatt hours from the grid and uh, so you can see the sunny days coupled with our ability to store the uh, power for extended periods of time got us past some of those cloudy days where we had uh, limited uh, contribution due to weather. And uh, again, to get the best idea of how we did, the best way to uh, look at that then is to take a look and and, and see what the how, what the battery contribution was for those three months. So uh, the uh, we'll pull that up here. And so then again, the important thing to look at is the to the grid numbers. Uh, those are. In a perfect world, those would be zero, but we're dealing with some of those little s switching errors and whatever. So the thing to remember there is that anything below 30 kilowatt hours on, on, on the two to grid number, it's negligible over an entire month. Just you know, kind of that is not really uh, uh, any contribution to the grid really at all. Uh, and so again, here, the last graph we'll take a look at is the battery activity for these three winter months. And uh, as you can see here, during the day, solar provides uh, uh, some of the power, and then that leaves uh, um, 15 to 12 
kilowatt hours or so uh, drawn from the battery to run the home before and after gaining that uh, uh, that charge and so as you can see here in the case of October, if you look close there, up until the uh, that day on the 29th where we, we discharged the, the battery into the car, uh, it, it was stable. It was at equilibrium, basically. You can see those small gray bars there, again, uh, that uh, that's just those annoying switching errors that caused by um, Tesla's little software malfunction that it was having. But uh, uh, usually, again, those are just in the one to three kilowatt uh, hour range and that's uh, been resolved currently, thankfully. So we'll talk a little bit about that again later in a, in a different video. And uh, if you're wondering why I charged my friend's car on uh, uh, on that day instead of uh, instead of ending the uh, the system on a high note, <laughs> I just couldn't stand it. We were we were at 9,975.3 miles, and there was just no way in hell that I was going to end the year and and not break 10,000. So that wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna happen. And so uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, we, we still have many of these videos to put out as we examine the the specific uh, aspects of it, as we had mentioned. You know whether that's uh, the um, uh, how much maintenance we did on the system over the course of the year, what our losses were, and so again, we'll try to keep all of these videos at that uh, 20 minute to half an hour mark as we went a little bit over. Obviously, we had a lot to uh, uh, cover, and if you see something in any of these videos that m makes you go, woo, and you want to see something a little closer, leave me a comment. Let us know in the comment section. I'll be happy to then go back into the raw data and uh, produce a video on what it is that you're specifically interested in seeing. So thank you all for hanging in there as we finalized all the data for this. And as always, the best of luck with your own systems. And we will see you again very soon.